Thank you for tuning in to a sermon from Redemption Hill Church. I'm so glad that you've joined us. It's our prayer that this will lift your heart and encourage you, set your eyes more fully on Jesus as we open God's word together. You can join us anytime in person or online in our live stream. You can find that at redemptionhilldc.org. If you're not in D.C., we encourage you to get involved in a local church where you live for the sake of encouragement and accountability in a local body, but we're also glad to have you join us and, and walk through this study with us. If you'd like to support the Ministries of Redemption Hill, you can do so at our website, again, redemptionhilldc.org. It is great to worship with you this morning. Welcome. Um, I'm glad to be with all of you and, and even those who are joining us online. Thank you for coming and joining us. We have a gift for you this morning that our greeters are going to come around and hand out. And so, yeah, come on forward, guys, and start getting those moving. So you're going to be handed a booklet today that is going to be a guide for us through the upcoming series. Um, by the way, my name is Bill Rydell. I'm one of the pastors here. Um, one thing, as, we, as they're handing those out, Pastor Rich mentioned that the furnace is broken right now. Um, you need to know that it is, like, broken, broken. It will not be fixed this winter. So um, the good news is that we, in 2019, did a renovation of the upstairs kids space, and it included installing heat and air conditioning. So that is going to be nice and warm and toasty, and we're working on solutions for the rest of the facility. So um, with that, you're being handed out a booklet right now, and I want to walk you through what is in here before we jump into the sermon for today. This is our gift to you. Um, if you're new, you're welcome to take one as well. Um, so we are starting a new series this Sunday that's going to be a six-week series, but really lead into a two-year initiative as a church called Dwell, an Enduring and Faithful Presence. And so this booklet that you're receiving is a discipleship guide to walk us through that initiative throughout, and throughout the series. You'll see that if you open it up on the first page, there's a table of contents. Um, and on that table of contents, I think we have a slide for that too, so, that it's, uh, so those of you who haven't gotten it yet can see. All right. Um, the table of contents, there's a blank that says, this book belongs to. We would love for you to write your name there. Um, actually, I think we have a box of pens somewhere. Do you know where that? It's in this office. Devin's going to get a box of pens, so if you need a pen, you can raise your hand, and our minister of music will come around. <laughs> All right. Um, so that is that, the table of contents. We're going to ask you to write your book, your name in the book. This is yours. We want you to bring it back with you every week um, and make this something that you take advantage of using. Over the next six weeks, the series, if you open it up, it continues to to go forward and there's a letter from the elders and a church timeline um, that talks about the series. And then if you flip to the back, you'll notice that there are blanks that are set up for each one of the sermons. And so for today, you can turn it to page 15 and 16, and it will be this, the, for this sermon, An Enduring and Faithful Presence. It has the passages for the, te for the week on one side. It has a place for sermon notes on the other side. And if you then turn the page, it has questions for reflection and guides for how, to, how you can pray this, giving, this upcoming week. And so that is um, an important thing for us that is going to take us through all six weeks of the series. And then if you go to the back, the last thing that I want to be able to point out is that there is a commitment card. Now, I want to make one comment right off the top here. We are not asking you to do anything with this today, um, but... This is going to come up again as we go through this series. What I am asking you to do with this today is that if Redemption Hill Church is your home, if you're a member here, if you've been attending here, if you consider us to be your church, I want you to put this somewhere where you can see it. Stick it on your refrigerator with a magnet, put it on your next, uh, you'll clip it to your computer screen, uh, where, whatever it might be that you will notice it and see it. Because what we would like you to do is that when you see this, that you would be reminded to pray, to pray for our church, to pray for this initiative that we're entering together, and to pray for the gospel to continue to go forward in and among and through what, the work that we're doing. And so um, that is the commitment card that is in a pouch in the back for you. Um, now, I want to just make one, a couple of other quick comments. Um, first of all, um, Paula Dudka did all of the graphics work for this series for the church. She's a member, and so I want to say thank you to Paula. Um, and we have done this on a very quick turnaround, and Jess Mitchell has 
um, done incredible work on doing some videos, setting up. There's a website, and actually, if you go to dwell.redemptionhilldc.org, there's a page dedicated to this initiative and this series. And so I'm thankful for the work that Jess has done preparing that as well. Um, and I think she's hiding in there right now. So, which is, all right, let's pray, and then we're going to get into the God's Word together. Father, thank you for the new year and the opportunity we have to, as a church to look ahead to new things and, and to look farther down the horizon to try to discern together what you're calling us toward. I pray that today as we open your word that you would, you would point our hearts and our, open our hearts, soften our hearts so that we might experience your presence, that we would understand who you are more clearly, that we could see the gospel more beautifully and begin to have a better understanding of our place in the work that you're doing and in the story that you're writing. And so as we spend this time together, Lord, as we spend this time in this series, as we look ahead to the next two years in this journey together, we pray that you would do abundantly more than all we ask or think that you would start in our hearts. And we pray that your word and your kingdom would go forward in this place. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, so today is, if you turn again to pages 15 and 16 in your booklet, you will be able to see um, the passages and sermon notes for today. Today's going to be a little different than what we typically do at Redemption Hill, so if you're new to our church, we most of the time, our default is to walk through books of the Bible, um, section by section, continuing our way through. And so when we get into February and begin the Lent season, we're going to jump back into a series that we've been in, in the Gospel of John, um, and that will take us through Easter this year. Um, and even next week, we're going to settle into a section of 2 Corinthians that will take us through the next four weeks. But today, we're going to do a little bit more of a look at biblical theology. So biblical theology is when we, we take and try to understand the whole of Scripture, the whole of what the Bible has to say about particular theological topics and try to distill out what it has to say about those things, where systematic theology is more based in philosophy, biblical theology is more, uh, it initiates in the biblical text. And so what we're going to do today is look at the sweeping storyline of Scripture to see a biblical theology of dwelling and a biblical theology of an enduring and faithful presence. And so the way we're going to do that is we're going to settle in the two primary texts you'll see in the booklet are Exodus chapter 33 and Jeremiah chapter 29. And so that is where we will begin together. Now, as, as we do, the, th the theme today is the series theme, that we would dwell in enduring and faithful presence. And th what we're going to look at first is that we were created to dwell in God's presence. And so as we look at Scripture, this is a major theme throughout Scripture. And um, I decided that in the, in the first like, 15 minutes of the sermon today, I'm going to preach the entirety of Scripture. And so we're going to roll through that quickly. In Genesis chapter 1, it says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then it talks about the form, that the land was formless and void, and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters of the deep. And so God's Spirit was, was there hovering, protecting, incubating as life was being brought by God in creation. As God created then, we see that he, he formed what was formless and filled what was empty. And then in chapter 2 of Genesis, he created man and woman. And he said, let us create man in our own image and likeness. And so he, male and female, he created them. And so I'm not going to walk through every chapter of Scripture, by the way. <laughs> um, but, but Genesis chapters 1 to 3 are essential. They are the foundation for the rest of what happens in Scripture. When he created man and woman in his image and likeness and brought them together, they dwelled in the presence of God. If you read the creation account, whatever we might think about age of earth or how you read that, it it's, at least shows us the power of God in creation and the personal nature of God in connection with the people that he made, with us. And in Genesis 2 and 3, we, we see that God was present with his people. If you read it, you'll notice that, that every one of the six days had an ending. It says, you know, it was, morning, it was evening and it was morning, and, and it was the first day, the second day, the third day. When you get to the seventh day, if you open Genesis chapter 2, the seventh day has no ending. 
It's showing us that God rested from his work and we were created to exist and dwell in the midst of God's presence in his rest. He gave them a garden to cultivate and to be able to build and cultivate and join him in his work of forming and filling this place. And so there was good work that they were called to do. And it tells us in Genesis 3 that he would walk with them in the garden in the cool of the day. But what happened? Well, he gave them one command. He said, don't eat from that tree. Satan came in the form of a serpent and said to them, you know, it, the first lie and raised the question of God's word and his goodness and said, did God really say that? Don't you think he's trying to hold out on you? He doesn't want you to eat it because he'll, you'll become like God yourself. And so they listened and they ate. And from that point, human history changed. They were barred from the garden because in God's holiness, their sin couldn't exist. And so then we see all the way through the biblical covenants, and that's what I want to walk through today in, this, in these few minutes, is we walk, as we walk through the biblical covenants, we see God's faithfulness in dwelling with his people, with pursuing them to dwell with them. And so in Genesis chapter 9, there was Noah after the flood when God had wiped out all of humanity except for Noah and his family. And why did he do it? Because of the violence of humanity against each other, because of the wickedness of humanity. But God made a covenant with Noah that he would never destroy everybody again because he wanted to pursue his people so that he could dwell with them. And what was the sign of that covenant with Noah? A rainbow. Thank you. (laughs) Yes, a rainbow is the sign of that covenant, a reminder every time it rains that God isn't going to wipe us out, all of us, through a flood. You go on to Genesis 12 and 15 and 17, and God comes to Abraham And he said to Abraham, in Genesis 12, he went to Abraham in the land of Ur and said, Abraham, go. I'm going to show you the place when you get there, but through you, all of the families of the earth are going to be blessed. In chapter 15, he pulled Abraham outside and said, look at the stars in the sky. This is what your offspring are going to be like. And there's going to be a place, a land that is described in Genesis 15 that he told Abraham about. And he said, this is where your descendants, where your children will dwell and rest. That was the land that was promised. In Genesis 17, there was a covenant made in circumcision that, there, that God would bring offspring for Abraham, and he eventually brought Isaac. Well, in Genesis, and then we move on to the people ended up in, not in that land, Abraham dwelled in tents. They ended up in Egypt because of Joseph. After 400 years in Egypt, they were enslaved, and God raised up Moses. He called Moses to bring his people out of slavery in Egypt, out of bondage to the Egyptian pharaohs. As Moses brought the people into Sinai, God met with them on the mountain. His presence came down, and Moses went up, and a covenant was made. In Exodus 19, we read this, that God came to the people and said, out of all the nations on the earth, you're going to be my treasured possession. You're going to be a kingdom of priests. And God was promising his presence would dwell with his people. So Moses went up to the mountain and was receiving the law, what it would look like for them to be God's treasured possession. And in the 40 days that he was up on the mountain, what did the people decide to make? The golden calf. It took only 40 days, and when Moses came down, they were dancing and worshiping an idol, a false image of of the gods that they had seen in Egypt. And I love Aaron's response in that. Moses' brother, he is the priest that's supposed to be leading people, and Moses gets down and says, what is going on? What did you do? And Because it says that Aaron had fashioned this golden calf for the people to worship, and Aaron's response is, I don't know. We put the gold in the fire, and out came this calf. It's the same thing we do now when we're caught red-handed with something, right? Like, I don't know what happened. It just happened. I had nothing to do with it. But in that moment, Moses, God was ready to, to start over. But Moses went to God to pray, to intercede, to step in and plead with God on their behalf. And this is what brings us to Exodus chapter 33, our first passage today. And Moses had, had broken the first tablets and he was meeting with God, interceding for the people, pleading with God. And, and so the, the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to a friend, it says in Exodus 33, 11. And when Moses turned again to the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, would, would not depart from the tent. So Moses was, was meeting with God in the tent of meeting, and Moses said to the Lord, 
See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you also have found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, don't bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? You hear what Moses is pleading here? He's saying, all right, Lord, you know, you've said that you know me by name, that I've found favor in your sight, and so if that's true, then, then let me, I need you to show me your ways. And, and Moses steps out a little bit on a limb here and says, all right, consider this nation, your people, your people that you brought out of Egypt on eagle's wings, as it says in Exodus 19. And he said, my, and, and so he said, consider this nation, your people. And so God's response is, all right, Moses, my presence is going to go with you. I'll be with you, and I will give you rest. Moses' response is the posture that we need to have individually and as a church. We don't want to go anywhere or do anything if God's presence is not with us. We want to say the same thing as Moses here when it says, if you're, you know, he says, listen, if your presence won't go with me, then don't bring me up from here. For how will it be known that we found favor in your sight? How will people even know that we're your people? The thing that sets apart the people of God from every other person on the face of the earth is that God's presence dwells with us. And so as a church, this is our plea. Lord, don't lead us anywhere if your presence isn't with us. So through Moses, the people um, ended up not going to the promised land, wandering around for 40 years. With Joshua, they were led in. But the next major covenant we see in Scripture was made with David. And David was the one, he desperately wanted to build a temple, a house for God. David hated that, that the king of Israel had a palace, but God was still, his presence was still in a tabernacle, a tent. But God said to him, David, there's too much blood on your hands. It's going to be your son who builds the temple. And David was only allowed to prepare the temple. But David had a promise given to him that somebody in his line, that a son of David would, would reign forever on the throne in Jerusalem. And so as that promise was made, I, this struck me. I, didn't, I hadn't seen this until recently, but in 2 Samuel 7, when God was promising that, this, this promise that goes directly to Jesus as, as the king the, in David's line, why Matthew and Luke both include genealogies to show that Christ is the king who came in the line of David. But in the midst of that, he also extends this promise to David. He says, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. So God promised to his people throughout, from the point of Eden, when they were removed from his presence, it was a promise, Abraham, you are going to be, a, you are gonna, through you, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed so that they can be brought back into the presence of God. Through Moses, you're a treasured possession, a kingdom of priests, so that everybody can come into the presence of God and worship the one true God. Moses pleaded with God, don't send us away from here without your presence. And God said, I will be with you and I will give you rest. And David, he said, all right, there's going to be a place for, for my people where they, will, where they will dwell and they will find rest. And then we see God's ultimate dwelling with humanity in the person Jesus Christ. And we've been in a series in John throughout the last, I don't know, probably year and a half as a church. And in John chapter 1, John, right off the bat, makes it clear to us. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him, in Jesus, was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. See, in Christ, God's presence dwelled within and took on flesh, 
Jesus was fully God, fully man. In him we see the fullness of God. In Colossians it tells us that in him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. But it's not just, so in the incarnation, God's presence took on flesh in the person of Jesus. He lived sinlessly. He was killed in our place for our sin and raised to life and then ascended to heaven where he rules and reigns, but he didn't leave us alone when he ascended. In John chapter 16, we read that there's the Holy Spirit of God who has been given to us to dwell within us, that we can rest in God's presence, that we never leave God's presence, that it goes with us wherever we go if we are in Christ. And then as we look ahead in Revelation 21, as we come to the end of Scripture's storyline, as the kingdom of Christ is fully consummated in a new heavens and new earth, as this place is renewed and restored to everything it was created to be, everything we were created to be in Eden, we read that there's a new heavens and new earth coming like a bride adorned for her husband and a loud voice from the throne said, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. The whole storyline of Scripture shows us God's desire to dwell with his people. It shows us his faithfulness to provide a place to dwell. It shows us his power in the incarnation of Christ. It shows us God's presence by the Holy Spirit. And it shows us the hope of a future dwelling with God. I want you to hear that again. And if we could get, to that, get that on the screen so everybody can see it as well. Listen, this is the storyline of scripture. It shows us God's desire to dwell with his people. It shows us God's faithfulness to provide a place to dwell. It shows us God's power in the incarnation of Christ. God's presence by the hope our presence by the Holy Spirit, and the hope of a future dwelling place with God. This is a, a thread that runs through the whole of Scripture. It's the, this is the beautiful good news that we call the gospel. I think there are times when we, when we think about the word gospel, we either think about music, which is great. I mean, I love gospel music and what Devin's doing to bring some of that into Redemption Hill's flavor. Or we think about the gospel as simply the work of Christ and his death and resurrection, which that is the, the center point of God's work in the gospel. But the good news of the gospel is the fullness of who God is, what he has done, is doing, and will do, and how he brings us into the story that he is writing. And so the good news of Jesus is that God dwells with us and by his spirit within us, and that we can get a glimpse of it now, what will be fully revealed in the end. And so there's an invitation to every one of us today as we begin this new year, that a, the sense of incompleteness we have, loneliness, like something is missing. Every one of us struggles with that at some level. Every one of us, every room we walk into, we wonder if we have a place, if we belong. We wonder if our presence is seen and if we're known and if we're loved. And God offered himself freely to us in Christ. He knows everything about you. He sees you as you are, and he loves you. He takes us in as his children to give us a family and hope and a future. And through faith in Jesus, we're welcomed as God's own. And so there's a call to us, every one of us, to see the beauty of Christ, to repent and believe today, because God's presence will be with us. It doesn't always feel that way, though, does it? All right, so this is the beauty, the biblical theology of God's, God's dwelling with us and his presence with us, God's desire to, for us. All of scripture shows him chasing after his people, drawing them toward himself, but there are times when God feels distant. When it doesn't feel, we can't feel his presence, we can't see that or notice that. When it's, 
I don't know, almost like long distance family where you're like, I know that they're there. I can see, even now we can see people on FaceTime. So there's that proximity, but you don't necessarily, it's different when you're in a room with somebody that you can feel their presence, feel their posture, feel the nonverbals of communication, but also they just connect in a deeper level. But God isn't distant, even when he feels that way. And this gets into his calling to us, that we're called to an enduring and faithful presence. And so this is, okay, God, we are created to dwell in God's presence. All of scripture is God pursuing us and and bringing us into his presence. And we then are called as God's people to be an enduring and faithful presence in this world that he has made. This call extends to the church. Peter wrote this in 1 Peter in chapter 2 when he said, listen, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Is that language familiar? We just talked about it today. In Exodus 19, this is the language that is applied to God's people as God met with them on Sinai. Peter is now saying this to anyone who's in Christ. If you are a Christian, this is who you are now. You're not alone, but you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's possession, and so that we might proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. These are echoes of John 1, that the light has come into the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. He says, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So beloved, I urge you, as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles or the nations honorable. The Greek word there is ethne, among the ethnicities. Honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Peter's calling to God's people is that we bring God's presence. We are his presence in this world as as we bring his presence with us and that our lives, as we live in exile, as sojourners, our lives, we're called to live in a way that people, even when they disagree with us or, or speak against us, might see the way that we live and when Christ returns, glorify him and worship him alongside us. But what in the world did Peter mean that we are exiles and sojourners? Now, I know some of you feel at home in D.C. Some of you have grown up in D.C. Some of you have made D.C. your home and you've been here a long time. And others of you, I know, feel like you're in exile. Because I've heard it from you. But whether you feel at home in D.C. or whether you feel like you're in exile in D.C., we need to understand that what Peter's calling us to is to have a bigger view, this biblical view that we just talked about, that if you are a Christian, if you are a follower of Jesus, then this world is not your ultimate home. That anywhere you live, you are a sojourner, someone who is passing through that place and headed to your ultimate home in God's presence in eternity. And so he's saying, as your sojourners and exiles, this is the way that you're supposed to live. That, that, that it, like, while peop, God's people came into the land, he promised them, and we need to see this in scripture too, that God's people did make it into the promised land, the land that was promised to Abraham, the land that, that Moses was leading them to, the land over which David was king as he united the kingdom for the first time. And so they came into that promised land, but, but it didn't lead to their ultimate rest, Eventually, God's people, they didn't stay there for good because eventually they were conquered and sent into exile in Assyria first and then in Babylon. And so when Peter uses this language of sojourners and exiles, he's calling on another place in Scripture that has been foundational for our church from the earliest days. Um, I preached this in August, but I want to take you to Jeremiah chapter 29 today as well. It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. You gotta love this, right? Because God doesn't mince words. God doesn't say like, sorry, I didn't see this coming. He says, I know you're in exile. I put you there. I know you're not in your home. You're in Babylon. But here's his word to them. They'd had another prophet come in, named Hananiah come and say that it was going to be over soon. And God says, all right, 
here's my word to you. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. Down a couple of verses, he continues, for thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you. That is not a short time. 70 years from now, most of us will be gone. That was true as he was writing, as this word came to the people in exile too. God was saying, you're probably not going to see the return from it. But in 70 years, I will fulfill to you my promise. I'll bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for your welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Look at the hope that he tells them about. He says, then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I'll hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. So Peter is drawing on these words of Jeremiah to say that this is what comes to us and how it extends to us, every person, every one of us who follows Jesus. No, this world is not our ultimate home, but, but God is not saying that we should live hunkered down and, and just escapist lives looking for the return of Jesus just so this ends and we get out of here and we just don't do anything in the meantime. He also doesn't say like, hey, you're in Babylon, so just become like every Babylonian yourself. God says, no, you are my people. I have put you exactly where you are. Paul says in Acts 17 that that the boundaries and times of our dwelling places are determined by God. He puts us where he does, when he does, so that all of us, those groping around trying to find him, would find him because he's near to every one of us. It is not an accident that you are here this morning. It is not an accident that you are in D.C. for this time at this place. God has placed you where you are, when you are for a reason. And so this comes to us too. And he says, all right, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens, eat their produce. He's saying, what, he's, he's calling them to have a vision of what it looks like to make their dwelling place even in exile. What does it look like to have the promise of God's presence, but in a place that's not our ultimate home? What does it look like to live so well that others worship God too? What does it look like to invest into the good, the welfare of our city? The word here is shalom. When he says, he says, seek the shalom of the city where I've sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its shalom you will find your shalom. And shalom is, is not just yeah, good in a, in a shallow sense. Shalom is, is holistic. It is healing. It is wholeness. It is peace. It is flourishing. And so the call is to seek the wholeness, the welfare, the peace, the flourishing of this place, to invest into it, to build and, and, and to make our homes here, to plant gardens and eat their produce, to cultivate and then add to the city, to have children and celebrate new life and new life in Christ. And the promise of God as we seek the shalom of the city is his presence. Look again, he says, then you will call upon me and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart and I will be found by you, declares the Lord. I will restore you and I will bring you back to the place that you were, you were made to dwell where I sent, from where I sent you into exile. What this means to us is that the same offer is extended. If you pray to God, he will hear you. If you seek him with all your heart, you will find him. That he can bring us restoration and wholeness and shalom and peace. And so some of you might be called to make DC your long-term home. Some of you who have grown up here might be called by God to continue to deepen your roots so that you you can be a part of his work here. I know that some of you aren't here for long, and the calling is the same. 
Invest into the good of this place. Make your home here while you're here. Focus on the good that God has for you here and now. And don't have a plan B on where you might be going next. And for our church, I want to see lasting fruitfulness in ministry in this place. Listen, Redemption Hill is God's work. This is not built on any individual. It is, it is a people. This is what we're called to. And so we might be investing ourselves into a church that we'll call home for 10 years or 20 years. Some of you might be investing your lives right now alongside us in a church that you call home for six months. But listen, any fruitfulness in ministry that we see is a result of, yes, God's work in and through us, but we have to also see that, that we stand on the shoulders of generations of God's people and Christians that have gone before us in this place. People who have prayed for God to send more workers into the harvest field. People who have given their lives to the welfare of the city. Churches who have come and gone running a natural life cycle but making a way for God's, fu God's future work and his word to flourish. So whatever happens with us personally or with our church, I want us to have the eyes to ha see a bigger perspective that we are part of a bigger story that God is telling. We are part of a bigger movement of Christ expanding his kingdom and the spirit calling dead hearts to life. We put a little church timeline in your booklets um, that if you turn, if you can find that in there, um, we have it on the screen as well. This is not the fullness of church history. We couldn't fit that in these books. <laughs> Um, a lot of books and a lot of ink has been spilled that way. But we need to realize that the work we do as a church, first of all, is rooted in creation. We just walked through the biblical covenants. But it goes back, the church was founded in A.D. 33, as the resurrection of Jesus, and two months later, the, as Pentecost came, the Spirit descended, 3,000 people were saved with Peter's first sermon, and all of a sudden, the church was formed and a movement began. From in the 80s, 30s to 60s, the resurrection of Jesus and the word of God were spread and churches were planted by the apostles. And so the book of Acts tells us about the foundation of scripture and the word of God advancing. Through church history, the, fa the church fathers established for us what was necessary to believe through the creeds and councils and what true Christian theology is. And in 1517, we find our stream theologically as the Reformation sparked a change in world history. In 1802, the District of Columbia was officially formed, where we sit now. In 1838, a gospel witness was established on the corner of 4th and D Streets Southeast. There's a little model church on the side of this church that marks the establishment of Little Ebenezer, which became the first school for African-American children in the District of Columbia. It's 185 years this year of witness on this corner. In 2010, my family moved to D.C. The dream to plant a church, to plant the seeds of the gospel and see a church grow from it here in, on Capitol Hill. In 2011, Ebenezer opened the door for us to meet here. And on August 21st, Redemption Hill Church was born. We've met in this place every Sunday, except for one when the pipes froze and sewage backed up, and we met in another church that Sunday. And last year was the only Sunday we ever didn't meet because the entire staff had COVID. But other than those two weeks... <laughs> We have met here every Sunday since 2011 to worship Jesus together. The church gathering in worship itself is a witness to the power of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. We gather on Sundays because he was raised to life on Sunday. And so we gather to celebrate the resurrection every week together. Through our work together, in 2014, Village Church Belfast began, and Redemption Hill was a key partner that invested into the start of that church in Belfast. In 2016, Doxa Iglesia Cristiana began in Mexico City as, as we sent the Rodriguez family to go and plant a church after doing a residency here with us, and we sent our own um, to where Chewy had grown up to plant that church, and now Pastor Eli continues to pastor it as it flourishes. In 2016, Redemption Hill was able to start a morning service meeting at 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. Up until then, we had, we had moved to a 4.30, 6.30, but we had a morning service for the first time. 
In 2018, we had, we, another church plant that we helped invest into, Village, East, Village Church East Belfast, was launched, um, or they launched Village South with Andrew Elder, who preached here over the summer. In 2021, Redemption Hill celebrated 10 years of ministry and faithful presence in our city. And in 2023, we believe that God is calling us to, to this Dwell initiative, a two-year discipleship journey as we trust God to work in us and through us to establish an enduring and faithful presence here. And so we can see the theme all through Scripture that, that, that of our need to dwell in God's presence and God's presence dwelling with and in us. We see the call of God's people to dwell with an enduring and faithful presence wherever we are, whatever our circumstances are. And so what does this mean for you over the next few weeks and months? Well, our primary goal with this initiative is 100% engagement from our church. We want you involved if you call this church home. We want you to join us in exploring and trusting what God has for us as we give ourselves first to the Lord. We want you to ask questions about your influence and lifestyle and generosity and legacy. We want you to really take seriously and consider what influence does Jesus have in your life and and how are you influencing the people around you? Does your lifestyle reflect the values of Christ's kingdom and are are you more focused on the eternal or on what is temporary? Are you in generosity? How is God inviting you to grow in generosity as an expression of trust and gratitude and putting him first? And what do you want your legacy to be? What has your life contributed to, and what do you want to be remembered for? We want to come together to give ourselves first to the Lord. There's a practical aspect to this initiative, too. Our secondary goal, and really, I want you to hear, the primary goal I have is is what God's going to shape in our hearts together. As a church, there are practical needs we have, too. The breaking of a furnace in our inability to be able to step in and repair it was a stark reminder this week. And so our secondary goal is we would like to raise $4 million over the next two years. Two million of that is what we would now call our general fund. And so we're doing, this is a one fund initiative. Two million goes toward ongoing ministry and mission. They will continue to glorify God together through gospel-centered worship, gospel-shaped community, and gospel-driven work in our city. We'll continue to be shaped by gracious hospitality and unified diversity and empowered membership. And so 1.8 million is our ongoing operations and ministry budget over the next two years so that we can continue to gather each Sunday and hear from God's word, so we can continue to teach our children the good news of Jesus, disciple each other through community groups, and meet needs in our community through mercy and justice and partnering with like-minded ministries. 200,000 is going to be invested outside of Redemption Hill Church, particularly in church plants across the nation and the world, and we are also working on expanding a current residency program to train church planters. The other $2 million is going to be set aside so that Redemption Hill could have a chance to have a permanent home. We'll need enough to have a down payment and initial costs, and $2 million would go toward that goal, to be an enduring and faithful presence, a gospel outpost, a legacy that will outlive us all. And if we exceed that goal, it only helps us to make those things a reality. Having a 24-7 facility that we can call home would help us to reach and reflect DC more, more fully through gathering and reaching out and serving and, and th- reaching more through going and re- reaching far through sending. And so it would give us a dedicated space where we can gather on Sundays, where we can be discipled by God's word and live, to be sent out to live lives that are different and attractive as we go to our homes and jobs and neighborhoods. We can provide a fun, clean, and safe environment to teach our kids effectively the truth of the gospel and reach kids in our community with special events that we're limited from now, things like a preschool co-op or kids' camps along the way, which already we've made some improvements. If any of you have been around long enough to remember what the kids' space was prior to August of 2019, um, it is fun and safe and clean. (laughs) Before that, I'm amazed that people entrusted their children to us. <laughs> Having a home, permanent home from our, for our church would give us the opportunity to gather any time for any purpose throughout the year. It would be a venue where we can host community events throughout the week and meet needs in our neighborhood um, in, in the surrounding areas. It would give us a more established place and presence to become a hub for training church planters. 
It would give us a place to be a more established and known presence among our neighbors, and we could finally serve coffee. (laughs) And so today, we're beginning this journey together. As your pastor, I've got to tell you, and we're going to talk about this more next week, we're going to spend time the next four weeks in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, seeing how the, the church in Macedonia gave and talking about finances together. As your pastor, I've got to admit, this is not the subject that I'm most comfortable with coming in front of you. Because I know there's all kinds of examples that we could point to of churches just asking for money and misusing money. Um, But what this is in my mind, what helps me get excited for this, is I'm really eager to see what God's gonna do in us and through us. And the money really is a secondary goal. It's a practical thing that we would need as a church to pursue some of these goals. But I wanna see us all engaged differently, more fully, can, it was something that we can chase after together and see God work in and through our church. And so listen, if this is your first day at Redemption Hill, you've actually picked a great day to come and join us. This is who we are and what we're pursuing together. We love Jesus, we love our city, and we're excited about what's ahead. If you're new to Redemption Hill, I'm glad that you've been around and that you're checking out our church. We want you to know, I want you to know that there is space and time that we will be patient with your journey. That it's okay to take your time and ask questions and, and try to figure things out. That, that, that's, that's okay. And also, if you're ready to make this your church home, then jump in. If you need more time, we'll walk with you. If you're an attender of Redemption Hill, some of, some of you have been around for a minute but you haven't fully committed yourself. You've still been around on the edges, and that's okay. But my hope for you is that you would get more fully engaged with our church. We want you to be engaged with us as well. Maybe you're ready to take a step toward membership. Maybe you should come join us at 12.30 today at the Starbucks at 3rd and Penn. And members of Redemption Hill, if you're a member here, The last three years have reshaped the landscapes of our city and our lives. And some of our members have struggled to re-engage with us. So my primary goal is that we get back on mission together, that we give ourselves fully to God and his work, that we see the opportunities around us to speak the good news into people's lives, and that we can build something together that will outlast us. That Redemption Hill could become an enduring and faithful presence that outlives, outlives us and is a lasting impact here in our city. So that is what we are calling you toward beginning today. I want to also say as we close, if you're here and you're not a Christian, you're checking it out and trying to figure out what Christianity is about and what Jesus is about, I want to go back to where we started. God's desire is to dwell with you. His faithfulness provides a place to dwell. His power has come in the incarnation of Jesus as God took on flesh. He died in your place and for your sin. And if you turn in repentance and belief, you're brought into the family of God. You're promised the presence of God through his spirit and given the hope of a future dwelling place with God in light where there is no pain or suffering or sorrow or sickness anymore because Christ will make all things new. Let's pray together. Lord, we lift our hearts and this church into your hands. Would you do what you please? Father, we're thankful that we have the witness of your desire to dwell with us, your desire to bring us into your presence and and your faithfulness and promise to give us your presence through Christ and by your spirit. I pray, Father, that you would move in our hearts, that we would really see the calling that your people have to build houses and to plant gardens and to make home wherever you put us and and live in a way that, that other people see it and also turn and glorify you and join you in your work, and join us in the work of renewing and restoring all things. Lord, we know that the things that we are asking can only happen by a movement of your spirit and power. 
And so we pray that you would give us sensitivity to your voice, clarity on what you call us toward, that you would give us a sense of excitement and joy. You give us eyes to see what you're doing, knowing that you're at work all around us. Sometimes we miss it because we're too focused on other things. And so would you give us the ability to see your work and to get in to join you in it? And so, Lord, we lift our hearts to you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.